Hi everyone and welcome to this panel about building communities with data and digital tech. Uh, joining me on this panel today we have Harmeet Chaga Khan who's an artist and filmmaker whose work uses immersive technology within socially engaged practice to explore different modes of storytelling. I also have with me Dr Miro Griffiths, who's a research fellow in disability studies at the University of Leeds and policy advisor to the UK Department for Health and Social Care, Department for Work and Pensions, the European Commission and the Liverpool City Region Fairness and Social Justice Advisory Board. And finally, I have Max Beverton Palmer, director of the Internet Policy Unit at the Institute for Global Change. I just need you to answer a couple more oh, questions on, on camera. If that's on okay. camera, sorry. Yeah, but not going out so starting off with um, Nero, I'd love to ask you, what does this idea of community building so we're gonna... mean to you? And what experiences or lenses will you be bringing to our discussion today? Uh, thank you, Eleanor. So I suppose it, my, my initial point is to consider uh, and acknowledge the historical and social contexts that reproduce marginalization and leaves a legacy of systemic violences and injustices towards detailed people. So we need to acknowledge that uh, data and the pursuit of data has led to forms of regulation, conditionality, surveillance, monitoring, and scrutiny over the lives of disabled people. So as part of that, we also need to recognize how technologies and particularly the funding for technologies how are predominantly entangled with notions of ableism and normality. And by that, I mean technologies are employed to fix and correct assumed limitations and deficiencies in the body and mind. So there's an, a fixation on using technology and data to reinforce species typical traits, certain abilities perceived as being normative and desirable. And if this continues, I think it's gonna corrupt our understanding of inclusion and accessibility and ideas of social justice. So we need to think about how we focus on the marginalization of disabled people, but other groups as well, uh, as a result of, and, and think about how those aspects of marginalization are rooted in the unnecessary restrictions in social organization. So thinking through the political, economic, cultural, social, technological arrangements that constitute the social world. And for me, that, that leads to three uh, questions, which I'll quickly just offer as insight. Firstly, I think there's a question about how do we support communities who want to disrupt and resist the ideas and practices and discourses that reproduce normality, reproduce ableism, and challenge the tolerance in society that continuously uh, oppresses marginalized communities and denies emancipation. Secondly, I think there's a question about how do we produce safe and accessible spaces for communities to experiment and create new forms of social organization, new forms that embrace variance within human existence, embraces the notion that there should be diverse and varied ways to participate in society. And finally, I think we have a question about how do we make our technologies and data open and accessible for communities to use as part of their aims, strategies, demands, resistance practices, that for those who are pushing towards realizing these ideas of inclusion and accessibility. Mira, thank you so much for those remarks and for those questions, which I'm sure we'll return to later in the discussion. Um, Harmeet, could I come to you next with the same question of what this um, the topic of this session means to you and the kind of experiences and lenses that you're bringing to this discussion? Yeah, absolutely, Eleanor. So for me, what's really interesting about data is how we can use it um, for storytelling in terms of bringing people together, uh, reframing the question of really not how we push humanity forward as a, as a global nation, but actually as communities and ecosystems, how we can actually create systems that allow us to dismantle and disrupt the status quo. So whether that's working with uh, young people from disaffected backgrounds, working with um, charities um, and specifically working with people in end of life care, whether it's working with young women at risk of sexual exploitation, whether it's working with um, 
uh, communities and groups of young black and Asian poets um, who want to reinvent the future. For, for me as a creative and an artist and a director creating kind of playable experiences, it's really about understanding how we can use data to reinform what the third social spaces look like and how they can then uh, ripple into how people can take ownership of the spaces that they currently inhabit. Thanks so much and great to see that there's kind of commonality there with some of the things that Miro was saying about disrupting the status quo. I'm sure we'll we'll hear more about that later on. Uh, Max, could I come to you finally on this question of um, what building community through data and digital tech means to you? Sure. Um, so I think what the two of the said has been very interesting and um, I guess how I'm a policy person, a regulatory person that believes um, that the way you tackle issues um, and harms and risks is kind of by good governance, which is designed, inclusive governance to design, which is representative. Um, but ultimately, I'm an optimist about technology and, and its power to change people's lives around the world. So um, my work looks at putting in those good governance approaches to um, tech, internet and data use um, wherever you may find it. Um, but also to think kind of optimistically about some of the stories um, that that share that people share and um, pushing them to the rest of the world to find out, like for example, how what we can learn from um, places in Africa that are using countries in Africa that are using uh, AI um, for the first time or social media for the first time, that use and what um, other places in the world can learn from that as well. Um, and when I say I'm an optimist, I'm, I'm, that's not to say um, that there aren't serious risks and harms that need um, tackling. Um, but I think kind of what inspires me when I think about these data issues um, at the moment in particular are kind of concepts such as like the querying of um, data use or querying of machine learning, where you think about the alternative uses for what has historically been particular use of a data set um, about kind of definitions which help people in the first instance, but then can be flexible and change in the future and, and good solid evidence based policy making supported by um, storytelling as well to to give policymakers those facts and to kind of um, make sure people are represented represented included in policy making. Great, thanks so much, Max, and to all of you for those opening remarks. I thought we might start with a bit of a, a, a broad question about what actually data is and what we're talking about when we talk about using data to build community. I thought I'd come to you, Hamid, first, just because in your practice you use kind of storytelling and perhaps more non-traditional forms of data than just sort of the, the big Excel spreadsheets that we might sometimes think about first and foremost. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about for you, what are the different forms of data and the, the uses and the power that they might have in building building community. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing about data is that it's it's everywhere. We're creating it all the time. We're leaking data, you know, on a daily basis just by being alive and present. Um, and so for me, what's really interesting when I'm working um, on building any experience, any immersive experience with any group of people is really kind of anchoring what's really important about the value of that experience. And then actually then you can kind of map out how you would collect or gather that data. It could be about personal experiences. It could, about, could be about how people use spaces. So for example, um, when I was one of three artists on the Data as Culture program a couple of years ago, we created a piece of work called Mood Pinball, uh, working with a group of neurodiverse adults. Um, and actually through that workshop process with the group, what we uh, found was actually that the way neurodiverse individuals uh, navigate city spaces is completely different to how neurotypicals navigate um, city spaces. Um, and so we created a life-size mood pinball machine. But actually what we found out was that the whole of the world is a user experience designed for neurotypicals. And if you're neurodiverse, everything is a workaround. Actually, during the pandemic, what everyone has realized is that the social model of disability has kind of leveled everybody up to the, to the same playing field when we were in the midst of lockdown. And that kind of then brings up questions about how we can redesign city spaces and how we can start, start thinking about city, city spaces that are really usable 
and accessible as spaces for the future for all of us and not just for those of us who are neurotypical. So I think part of that data collection process is understanding really how people, how individuals can contribute to this story, this play space, and then actually designing an experience where people want to play it because it's fun, but actually people will want to play it because they will embody a sense of something else. And that's really where the change and the behavior change occurs. And that's the really exciting space for me by using data and digital tech. Brilliant. And um, Mira, I was wondering if I could bring you in on this question as well of qualitative and quantitative data forms and the kind of different purposes that they serve in community building. Yeah, I think it's really it's, it's a great question because it allows us to think through not just the collection and dissemination of of data and 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 the, and the findings from data, but also it question the question of what knowledge is being produced by the way in which we um set out our designs our research our inquiries um so data is about having evidence to justify or to push forward with certain uh, programs or, or initiatives but it's also to allow us to rethink and destabilize some of the uh ways in which we have organized society in the way in which we 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 carry out practices and activities uh, similar to the to the point just made previously about um the, the, the dominance and tolerance of, of neuro, neurotypicality in, in society. Um, so I think there is something about how we ensure people are part of the narrative and part of the acquisition of, of data and the use of data. But that requires us to think through how we frame the problems in which we are exploring. And if I think about the history of disabled people's experiences, often those who have an ex incredible amount of influence and, and authority have articulated the problems experienced by tail people um, in a way that is misaligned with the ideas and aspirations of disabled people who are politicized, disabled people who are, who are practicing resistance. So for example, we have seen uh, projects and data collection that has reinforced overtly medical or overtly tragic narratives, which has then led to policies that are rooted in individual uh, sufficiency or individual responsibility to address barriers and, and issues. So one thing is about making sure that communities are part of the collection of data and the making sense of data, but we also need to make, make sure that when we are uh, carrying out initiatives to collect and utilize data, how closely aligned are they with the ideas of emancipation, with the ideas of inclusion and accessibility as articulated by the communities that we are thinking about. Thanks, Mira. That's so interesting. And I, I think I, I wanted to bring Max in on this because um, we've been talking about, I guess, stories as a kind of data and the, the, the power of having experience rooted at the heart of how we collect data. And I just was thinking also about the kind of stories and narratives we might also have out there that are so divorced from data and real people's lives. And in particular, how that um, affects the trans community and I wondered Max if you want to talk a little bit about about that and how we use data and experience more in that particular emancipatory struggle. Yeah so I mean it's really interesting with this conversation because we have a bit of a tension here is like um, stories as the way you, you you decide to make a decision or kind of make evidence on, or on anecdotes and then stories as a kind of metadata as a su supporting um, piece of data and and data by um, its very nature is is going to be very it's never going to be perfect because it's always going to be a kind of particular definition of a person which collecting um, information especially but as it comes to issues around kind of uh, identity whether that's um, kind of sexuality or gender identity and I think um, what we've seen at the moment in with um, with uh, trans the discussion of trans issues particularly in in the UK is a, a kind of real divorce from the the basic data and then a kind of new call to look back at like what are the data what's the actual experiences of people in kind of pretty basic hard data about um experience in housing experience in healthcare and so um one of the most kind of inspirational things i've read recently is a book um i'm sure many people know by um sean fay and she um, writes a written a book called um, the transgender issue, which is a, a kind of real 
call for um, uh, a better um, collection of better collection of data, and just sort of sets out. She sets out just the basic facts about the kind of trans community and its experience, um, and works like that are so important at just kind of trying to reset the narrative and use data along with storytelling. We use kind of simple data to um, tell the actual lived experiences of, of people rather than this kind of colloquial anecdote um, or I guess a kind of um, received wisdom about the experiences of other people that, um, uh, that, we, all, that, all have, that we all have when we um, encounter experiences that are outside our own lived experience. Thanks, Max. And um, all of you have touched in a way on um, some of the issues of, I guess, kind of co-creation and co-production of data and embedding the experiences of um, marginalised communities at the heart of our data practices. And um, Mira, I just wanted to come to you because um, in your opening remarks, you touched on the issue that a lot of the communities we're talking about have been historically some of the most kind of surveyed and at the sharp end of some of the most unethical data practices so i was wondering for you what does true co-creation or true kind of trust and safety look like when we are collecting and using data to ensure you rebuild some of that lost trust so i think it, i think it, it starts with acknowledging the history um and also within that i think there is uh, a negligence when we think about co-production in contemporary forms, because the assumption is, well, as long as those groups have access to those dialogues or tables where decisions are being made, that's all that needs to happen. And actually, there is a history where communities have been told, your voice doesn't matter, your ideas don't matter, you don't have a credible voice until it's been validated by professionals um, and professional networks. So there's a recognition of how we build communities and support uh, notions of empowerment, notions of emancipation, within those communities so that they can feel that their voices are listened to, that they are respected, and that their ideas can contribute and influence the way in which we design and organize the social world. Then I think it's about thinking through how we facilitate resources, we share resources, we share the power and the, and the opportunities so that communities um, are in positions where they are either gatekeepers or they are commissioners of services and, and and programs and initiatives within their own communities. But I also think it's about how to, and I think to go back to Max's point, it's how we think through the collection of data as a way to influence policy at the macro level as much as at the, at the meso and the micro level. And if I think of something like the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, data collection and monitoring and analysis of, of the data surrounding disabled people's life chances is embedded within the convention. It talks about the importance of collecting the data, but also ensuring that disabled people have access to that. And it remains open and, and open for interpretation and, and, and uh, insight from these particular communities. So I think it's, a, it's always about thinking through the history first and acknowledging where those issues have emerged that have denied people opportunities. But it's also thinking a little bit more creatively about how can we go further than what we're doing now? Because really, when I think about many examples of co-production, particularly when they are instigated by the state or by local government and administrations, they're not forms of co-production. At best, they're forms of feedback or tokenistic consultation. And uh, Harmi, I was wondering, uh, from your experience as uh, a creative and um, kind of commissioning and working on a lot of these uh, data and storytelling related uh, project, what's been your experience of actually working with marginalised communities and trying to make sure that you are building these projects in a way that does preserve trust and make people feel like they have a safe space to express themselves? Um, it's always, it is about creating that trust and that safe space, you know, when you when you work with a, any community, you know, there's, a, there's a, definitely a sense of privilege that you're in that space and so actually part of the role of an artist and a creative is to make sure that you um, honour that space in the right way that the information that you're collecting that the process that you're taking people through that the end result the experience the piece of work 
um, that it's not just a, a case of harvesting what people are giving you, but actually that they are part of that for a greater good. You know, whether that is that um, people will see uh, a different view on life, whether they will understand a different perspe perspective or story told from a completely different lens. Um, and I think part of my role is um, taking real care of what happens to those stories, what happens to the data and the information that people are giving to, giving to me. And then also, you know, curatorially making the right decisions about how that experience, how that piece of work is then built. You know, quite often I'll be in a situation where um, um, people, you know, give certain bits of information, uh, they tell the most incredible stories, um, the narrative that can be built around these experiences, this universe the kind of world building that we do is immense, but actually they have the right to pull that permission release and you have to absolutely respect that space too. Um, I think some of the considerations when um, now working in um, experience building, especially in immersive, rather than just creating, um, you know, a kind of a linear experience is definitely about being mindful of who you're working with on your creative team that can support and assist um, any community you're working with. So um, what will happen to the, the data and the stories after the lifespan of the project? You know, will that exist as an archive or a collection somewhere else, for example? Um, will people be able to access it, um, you know, in a different space, whether that's a website, a museum, you know, or somewhere else within the community? But also actually, um, how can people um, also start to build things outside of what you're creating so actually that exists so some of the people on the team may be people working within the community at local community centers and hubs um, some of those people on the team may also be um, uh, people that work in psychology so actually there is a sense of safety there's no one being triggered by sharing personal and emotional stories but also then there's, there's a sense of looking towards the future to see actually what is the legacy of this project and how can it kind of have a long lasting impact on people? Thanks, Harmi. And there's just so much richness in this discussion and I wish that we had time to delve into all of the issues, but I'm conscious we've got about five minutes to go. And having acknowledged, I guess, some of the sort of risks or kind of historical pitfalls of, of data and digital tech for marginalized communities, I was hoping to turn more to the, to the optimistic side of things, and I, starting with you, Max, because you sort of outed yourself as an optimist in your in your opening remarks. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the ways that you are optimistic about community building through data and digital tech, and in particular, how you think those practices that might currently exist in marginalized communities could have a positive effect on the whole of society if they kind of become more widespread. Yeah, it's a good question. I guess I have two, two points. So one, um, sometimes defining definitions and data can be useful, particularly for LGBTQ plus communities as well. In the first instance, the gift of creating that space for people to like um, associate with a particular definition or a data point in order to explore their identity. So um, me personally, as a kind of bisexual man, it's really important that there was that kind of definition that was there that you can hold on to but then is fluid later so those things don't hold forever and you're not defined by a, a data point um and i and i hope that the kind of advances in kind of data collection um and the analysis we can do design um, and systems designed by people who are kind of in the lgbt community more queer or, or people who are who are less kind of typical um across many different kind of characteristics can help us design better ways of articulating these things but also not locking people into systems so i'm optimistic about that i'm also optimistic about the um the millions of people and the billions of people around the world who aren't um online yet who kind of have a chance to tell their stories to the world and some of my colleagues have done some great work on um using social media people using social media to um, tell new narratives about, for example, the experience of people in African countries um, for the work we do across the continent. I think it's, it's just incredibly interesting and you kind of learn loads of experiences and create, and it's really important that we all collectively continue to create those spaces, both at the macro level in terms of the free and open internet and at a micro level in terms of um, representative communities as well, so that those stories and that progress can continue. 
Thanks. And in the last two minutes, um, we just had a question come in about resistance and just someone asking whether the panel can say a bit more about their thoughts on the role of resistance in making change. And so, Mira, I just wondered, kind of as a, a final word, would you like to speak a little bit about how you think tech and data and resistance all come together to, to lead to a more emancipatory world? Well, I think, you know, resistance for me sits uh, ontologically and chronologically prior to power. So resistance is possible and resistance therefore allows for opening of new ways to not just challenge aspects of injustice uh, that perpetuate people's marginalization, but I think resistance is also the, the creativity that produces new ways of thinking through what's preferable, what's possible in terms of organizing the social world, in terms of experiencing liberation, experiencing emancipation. So I think starting from the point of resistance and entangling that with aspects of accessibility and thinking through what does it mean to have accessibility within our infrastructures, within our arrangements, that's how you move towards ideas of emancipation and ensure that those ideas of emancipation are led by the communities and voices of those who are experiencing a, a forefront of injustices on a daily basis. Thanks so much, Mira. And Harmeet, very quickly, last minute or so, do you, is there anything you want to say on this question of resistance? Oh, I think I think we're living in an incredible time right now. You know, um, the digital and the physical are you know collapsing into one another. You know, we have so much information and knowledge. You know, at our fingertips. Um, and I see it when I work with young people. I'm working on a project right now where young people are creating immersive stories to influence change in Nairobi and in Coventry. And actually, you know, the personal has become the political and the, the way we move forward by using data, by using storytelling, is to think about how we can distribute power so that those stories using data become a part of the mainstream. And that for me, I think is a really exciting space as we move forward. The future belongs to all of us, but it also belongs to the brave. Well, thank you so much, Hamid, Max, Miro, for a really fascinating discussion. As I said, we probably could have gone on for hours on all of these different points, but hopefully uh, that's given everyone plenty to go away and think about. Um, and thank you so much to the ODI for having us here and facilitating this discussion.